jujitsu um, also teaches you how to be grounded, be humble. It truly, like, it humbles you. The process of going to class, being submitted, and tapping out, paying your dues, and being humble through loss. That's just a part of training. But you can always apply the attitude towards um, life outside. Brandon, we usually start these interviews, at least the first five, um, in, I suppose, a chronological order. Um, so we typically start with the later years of high school um, through to university and the early stages of the workplace. Um, but today I wanted to switch things up a little bit. Um, and I wanted to start with something that's been really influential in your life, um, that being judo and martial arts. Um, so as we were touching on um, off air just a second ago, um, you mentioned that you were introduced to martial arts by your, your father at the age of six. Um, and in an excerpt of your book, which we'll talk about later, um, you've described it as, you know, really changing your life and having a, I suppose, a life-changing effect um, up until your life uh, to this point. Um, and you've talked about how it's actually shaped your personal and professional development. Um, you know, you've talked about how it's taught, taught you to be resourceful in your approach um, to success and self-development. Um, so that you make sure you're using um, your time, energy, resources, uh, and the people around you um, as, a, as a basis for your own success. So to start with, Brandon, um, can you tell us a bit about um, how you actually got into martial arts? Sure. So I went into, tra into martial arts training at around like um, six-ish six or eight, uh, eight years old. My first role model was actually my dad, so it was interesting because... Uh, my, my dad, my sister and I would often go to this area called Deep Water Bay in Hong Kong. I did cycling and um, my favorite moments involved having my aunt's corgi, um, Jerry. Uh, it's a Pembroke Welsh corgi, by the way, running around with us. And my least favorite moments um, involved my dad suddenly asking my sister and I to stop what we'd be doing, get off the bike and just start doing Kung Fu forms with him. So <laughs> we'd typically be at a point near the beach where... Um, a lot of people will be looking at us and we just start doing forms. I don't know, I hated it. It's like so embarrassing. <laughs> um, I didn't like how I looked at those weird poses um, and like hand movements and um, mm. you know, kids nearby laughed at us. It was that one thing that my dad and I would always like fight about. <laughs> um, but one day it changed. Um, my dad brought me to the cinema and we watched this fantastic Kung Fu movie called uh, Ip Man. It's like a Chinese Kung Fu master. Yeah. It was played by Donnie Yen. Um, and Grandmaster Ip Man was actually a real practitioner and teacher of Bruce Lee. So, and he was also the Grandmaster of the Kung Fu style that my dad made me practice um, <laughs> in front of all those people. <laughs> so uh, what was even more surreal was that my dad's teacher was actually a direct apprentice of uh, Grandmaster Ip Man. Um, so um, once I found out, I flipped the script. I was like, dad, you have to teach me. I begged him to teach me more. And he just, uh, my dad had a gloating smile. He was like, yes, it worked, you know. I converted him. So that's how it started. Um, I think a lot of kids get into uh, martial arts and either from movies or just from um, just getting uh, bullied where they try to, uh, so they learn how to defend themselves. Yeah. I trained pretty seriously. I trained in striking until I got to the age around like 17, 18, where I transitioned to more grappling styles. Mm -hmm. um, the catalyst was probably from this one time I sparred with my friend who was a grappler. And obviously it wasn't like a full on 100% intensive sparring match, but I knew I'd keep up short against his uh, joint locks, his grappling, his takedowns and groundwork. Yeah. Um, so I started cross training. Uh, my first grappling I was Japanese Jiu Jitsu, which emphasized joint locks and self-defense. It, um, it originated from uh, Samurai, mm -hmm. uh, where because of the armor um, that, that they wore in the battlefield, they could not use strikes, they weren't effective. So when they lost a weapon, they had to utilize of throws and takedowns to gain like a gain like a dominant position. Um, so and so and so I trained um, in Japanese Jiu Jitsu and I realized that my throws were they weren't up to par. So I started judo, um, which is essentially sport jiu jitsu um, in a sport context where you aim to throw the other opponent onto the back um, for like a point, a full point, or you can get like an arm lock or a strangle to win uh, the full point. And uh, later on, three months into judo, I realized my groundwork was deficient. 
So I picked up Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which is um, a sister art of Judo and um, emphasizes on groundwork. Right. And learning Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, uh, I came with freestyle wrestling, uh, which I studied for a few months. Um, and, the, and that style of freestyle wrestling essentially contained banned Judo techniques, which, allow, which don't allow you to grab the leg. So currently I'm practicing Japanese Jiu Jitsu, um, mm -hmm. Judo, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and Korean Hapkido, which is essentially the Korean version of Jiu Jitsu, um, same other art really. And to me, those are just really different flavors of Jiu Jitsu, which have different ranges of um, effectiveness, uh, rule sets and training methods. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's on, to be honest with you, it's quite interesting to see how, you know, you've dabbled in different um, types of jiu-jitsu over the years. And I mean, ultimately, from those early days of your, your dad teaching you um, jiu-jitsu in that park, you, you've gone on to, um, you know, be quite successful as a semi-professional athlete in judo. Um, you know, as we touched on earlier, um, you represented your university, which is uh, the University of Sydney, quite extensively. Um, in, in several competitions, um, one of them being the Central Coast Opens. I wanted to ask you about how, the process about how you transition from, um, you know, uh, martial arts becoming a bit of a hobby to then competing um, at a semi-professional level. Um, what was that journey mm. and process like for you? Okay, that's a really good question. Um, I think it had to do with the fact that I realized that um, I, in order to to really be, um, I think, comfortable mm -hmm. with the onslaught of aggression in a self-defense situation, mm -hmm. you really need to be desensitized to uh, full resistance. And um, owing to the nature of the techniques I studied in Japanese Jiu-Jitsu, um, you really can't do them with full resistance because injuries can definitely happen, it's guaranteed. Mm. So, and, and that's not to say that the training method of Japanese Jiu Jitsu is not good. I appreciate it very much. Um, but I realized I needed to actually expose myself to uh, more stressful situations. And, you know, when you're, when you're sparring in Judo, Jiu -Jitsu, that's BJJ, that's when you are facing an opponent who is fully um, resisting and not letting you put on techniques. Um, and at the same time, they're trying to put techniques on you. So um, I transitioned to sport with that intention of learning how to keep my composure, learning how to uh, be desensitized to the mm -hmm. onslaught of full resistance aggression. And so my style definitely borrows from different aspects of the arts that I've studied or am studying. Uh, ultimately the goal was always to be able to absorb different things. Um, what, what, each, uh, what every style is good at. I think that's something that can be integrated to my style. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that draws a parallel to being open to learning from uh, new things and skill sets in uh, one's career. Yeah. Um, I think at different points in my journey, I definitely have gone through a lot of disillusionment mm -hmm. and critical self-critique many, many times, which led me to identify my shortcomings and like seek out um, different teachers and like different disciplines so I can enhance my growth. I don't think there's anything, I don't think there's any end to learning new things. You can always learn new things from people who are better than you. And I actively try to apply that to my academic and uh, professional career. So an interesting piece of content, um, which I came across on your social media was this post about uh, two Olympians. And um, the essential message, what, the essential message um, of that post was, um, you know, two people can be equally as successful in the sport. Uh, despite having two totally different styles and appro approaches. And uh, in that post, you essentially broke down their, their techniques um, and you said that, you know, due to their differing um, physicalities, um, they had two, you know, different approaches to, to the sport. Um, and you also mentioned that those differences aren't necessarily limited to the physical realm. Um, they also exist in the mindset that you adopt um, going into a particular competition, for example. Um, and I think, you know, something that summarizes that really well is um, this quote, which you mentioned, which was, um, don't just blindly absorb an entire technique, uh, analyze it uh, and critique it for yourself. Um, so having read that, I imagine that in martial arts, there isn't necessarily one um, cookie cutter style, um, which will bring you success. Um, you know, potentially every student has to develop and form their own um, sort of practice and style. 
Um, so my question to you in that case, Brandon, is how did you go about developing your own style uh, of martial arts? Um, developing my own style of martial arts is a process of constant self-critique, um, mm -hmm. understanding my shortcomings, and um, at the same time, um, identifying and reading about uh, what other people are good at. Um, I, th I think that uh, there's a lot. Every every martial art is a part of, is a part of the solution. Every mm -hmm. every every style is a part of the answer. Um, they just respond to different needs of society. Some can just be some martial arts can just be for um, cultural like exploration. Some can be for like physical health. Some can be for mm -hmm. combative effectiveness. Mm -hmm. So when you keep your mind open uh, regarding sort of like what each style can offer. I think that it just comes to you that um, the opportunities to learn always comes to you. It's just a matter of embracing what the fuck. Like it's, yeah. it's just um, a conscious decision on your end to decide if you want to do, if you want to learn from other people. And um, that's really all there is. If you can open up your, if you can let go of your ego, um, if you are willing to start from a white belt, I'm starting as a completely white belt in Korean Hapkido actually. And it's humbling, it really is, because you realize that you may think that when you walk in there, oh, I already have all this background, but at the same time, um, different styles have different nuances of how to do techniques and different concepts. So let go of the ego, that's what I did, and just learn and be open. Yeah, um, and I think the beauty of you know some of the messages that you've, you've just touched on there is that um, they can easily translate um, you know, from a, like a quote unquote sporting context to a broader personal and professional context as well. And um, I suppose in that, in that sense, it's a, it's a great analogy for your own development. Um, you know, that being, you know, you're always in a state of growth and in a state of change, as you've mentioned um, a couple of times now, um, you know, particularly at our young age where, um, you know, a lot of the times we're always challenging ourselves um, and we shouldn't necessarily be comfortable with success. Um, you know, I suppose, you know, letting go of your ego is an important part of that as well, as you just mentioned. Um, so, I mean, in, in terms of the process of developing your own craft and your own style, um, obviously that comes with, you know, a lot of work, um, a lot of hard work, a lot of training, sacrifices. Um, but I suppose ultimately in the end, um, you know, that process in itself can be very self-fulfilling and rewarding. So one thing I did want to touch on as well um, in the chapter of your book um, was another quote, um, which was about, well, I'll read it verbatim. Um, it was discovering jujitsu is the key to my success in self-development and career ambitions. So Brandon, what was it about jujitsu that really helped, helped you with your own personal and professional development? So, um... I think I can probably start from like the very last paragraph mm -hmm. of that particular chapter that I wrote. Uh, it uh, essentially what I said was over the years of my training, I my perception of a black belt is someone who's able to impose their will on someone who's fully resisting with pure technique. Um, but as a coming of age epiphany, I, I realized that a true black belt is actually someone who can translate those lessons, those non-physical lessons from a dojo um, off to mat. So being able to move those um, lessons that you take in on the mat and then you can apply them off the mat. Um, because really a black belt should signify capable martial arts, right? And the essence of being this type of artist is the art of using the lessons that you have learned through uh, your physical experience and physical training to better yourself outside of the mats. So um, yeah, I definitely started asking at, at like, I'd say around when I was 20, that's when I really started asking, like, how do you carry those lessons up? You know? Mm. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you mentioned, you know, uh, an important principle for you is, you know, translating those lessons from on the mat to outside the mat. Um, and mm. what I found really cool about you is that you were able to articulate and express those into um, five key lessons uh, in your, in your mm -hmm. book that you're developing at the moment. Um, so I wanted to give mm -hmm. you a chance to, uh, elaborate on those five lessons. Um, as you mentioned off air, you don't have to go into um, the, the X's and O's of, of exactly those five lessons. But, um, you know, for those that haven't seen, seen that particular chapter in your, in your book, um, can you summarize those five lessons that you've learned um, from Jiu-Jitsu? Sure. So um, to go 
to take a step back, mm -hmm. what really drove me to write that book, um, to write so much about how jujitsu changed my, shaped my personal career and development um, is, uh, it really, the process of writing only took like three hours. It was pretty natural because I was just drawing parallels between what I did uh, on the mat and off the mat. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I'm definitely very privileged to share this epiphanies um, with everyone here. So just a little background on people who uh, may not know what traditional Japanese Jiu Jitsu is like, because we get exposed to a lot of like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu from UFC and um, just a little bit of clarification. So yeah. traditional Japanese Jiu Jitsu is a samurai art that's centered around utilizing leverage, timing, and just manipulating um, your opponent's resistance into uh, against it. So from a physical standpoint, um, Jiu Jitsu is just about using like proper timing and leverage, right? And, but beyond this level of physicality, um, the philosophy of Jiu Jitsu is about using the most out of, making the most out of what's available to you um, to develop yourself. And, you know, time and energy you have and uh, time management, that's, that's Jiu Jitsu, it really is. Um, the resources you, you own, um, and as well as the people in your life, right? And um, how, and in learning how to fight efficiently, you learn how to live efficiently. Mm -hmm. Um, so the first takeaway or perhaps the first lesson um, is that jiu-jitsu teaches you how to be critically um, self-reflective and being honest with yourself um, because really failure is baked in a cake you it's guaranteed in like judo and Brazil, Brazilian jiu-jitsu um, and I'm, I'm talking about like this these like particular styles of sport jiu-jitsu yeah. um, where during sparring you're going to get dominated by someone um who's more skilled than you, you get, you're get you going to get submitted over and over again. And it's, um, it's disheartening, you know, you, but in learning to deal with failure, you start to reflect on um, what you, what you need to work on and critically evaluate on what you can do better at. Mm -hmm. And so, and you really have to be honest about, Oh, I'm not really moving my hip that well. I'm not really that mobile with my, uh, with how I utilize my humerus. Um, so without undergoing that process, sparring just keeps exposing your mistake, mistakes over and over again, in probably a rather brutal fashion. Um, so the second lesson is that it teaches you the importance of direction and sequential step-by-step -step progression, being patient, uh, consistent improvement, and also being humble. Um, so just following on like the previous lesson that I mentioned on mm -hmm. um, figuring out what you need to work on and once you figure out what you need to work on you need to start developing like an objective um, you need to figure out how to be strategic on um uh, you need to figure out sort of like your goal setting process essentially because you need to have a clear sense of direction of knowing how you can take step-by-step -step, um improvement um actions step-by-step -step actions to improve your progress and uh to improve your game or your technical abilities you learn to be patient and appreciate those little successes in a complicated movement. That's that's pretty important, you know? Um, very often in our careers, we're so focused on just achieving the big wins um, <laughs> or, and we put all our hope into them, but we forget to recognize those small moments of like achievements and milestones um, you've reached along the way. Um, because when mm -hmm. accumulated throughout time, um, those successes are gonna be the consistent measure of your growth. I, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in the end product just as much as the process of growth itself. So being able to recognize small wins, jujitsu um, also teaches you how to be grounded, be humble. It truly, mm -hmm. like it humbles you. The process of going to class, being submitted and tapping out, paying your dues and being humble through loss. That's just a part of training. But you can always apply the attitude towards um, life outside the dojo because um, you learn to be more resi uh, more resilient uh, in the face of setbacks and mistakes and uh, and failure. Mm. Uh, the third lesson is being accountable. It teaches you to be accountable, to be hardworking and patient. Uh, one of my mentors uh, said that jiu-jitsu is just a, it's just really about hard work and consistency, magnified by guidance um, towards where you direct your energy. So. Um, Jiu Jitsu teaches you to hold yourself accountable for putting in, a putting in like the necessary work to improve. Because as an individual, you alone have to take the responsibility of um, your, your body, um, your training, and um, no one else can do it for you. You can't delegate that discomfort or 
um, and the effort needed to improve to somebody else. Mm. So, but if you're able to hold yourself accountable, um, you can always see results and improvements because um, mm. if you utilize the right strategies and you stay consistent, you can really achieve anything you want to do. So um, to achieve mastery, there's no shortcuts. You have to pay your dues patiently. And uh, in time, you'll realize that, um, you know, paying your dues and putting the time and effort needed is the only, is the one and only critical part that you could have taken. When you look back, you would know that, yeah, I should, that was the only way I could have done it. And I'm so glad I've done it. That's probably the most important. That's probably the most valuable epiphany you'll have once you're actually, actually successful when you look back. Mm -hmm. um, the fourth takeaway is that jujitsu teaches you um, to, uh, it, it doesn't teach you to avoid conflict, Conflict sometimes does happen, but it teaches you the price of conflicts. Um, it, it also teaches you the benefits of leaning into resistance and being flexible to make better decisions. Because um, I think I mentioned this in my in that paragraph, that mm -hmm. chapter, that you know, first belt in Japanese traditional, traditional jujitsu is actually the red belt. It's danger. It symbolizes danger, danger of fire, fire, danger of aggression, ego, lack of self control. Uh, and yes, in a physical conflict, uh, if you, 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 it may be tempting to showcase your skills, right? Uh, but even if you're like the last man standing, it's mm -hmm. not really, you're not really victorious because the thrill of, um, to, to, uh, the, the thrill of like satisfying your ego, it lasts way shorter than even like a fractured finger that, that could take, you know, mm. uh, I actually have fractured my finger before, it took months <laughs> to heal, but the point yeah. is, um, <laughs> the, the point is um, th this thrill of winning a fight or winning a confrontation, not just a physical fight, even like a verbal um, uh, fight, sometimes it, it's not really worth it because um, you, you wanna be able to find alternatives to understand the grounds of your opponent, what they're trying to, what their intent is and what they're trying to achieve it's always better to be able to like work around their resistance instead of fighting it. Why not do it like jujitsu? Why not try to achieve a mutually benefiting agreement? Win-win. Um, so it teaches you to lean into resistance by working around it flexibly. Um, and really the brilliance of jujitsu, um, as I, this is, I, I read this um, quote from my mentor, is that the brilliance, the brilliance of jujitsu is found in um, letting go of something you wanted and recognizing the next opportunity mm -hmm. because it teaches you to make concessions during a professional career and um, being flexible with how you handle conflict and disagreements will, will serve you a long, long way. Um, the fifth and final takeaway and epiphany I had, which is that it teaches you to be, to be prepared, to be confident and be calm. Uh, and truly, when you have like when you do sparring and judo and BJJ, um, I would say a third of your techniques typically fail. Uh, but you need to have a technique to have uh, as like a backup. Like if Plan A fails, go for Plan B. If Plan B fails, go for Plan C. And if Plan C fails, go back to Plan A. <laughs> so be prepared to have a backup plan to fall back on during different types of your career, and um, ensure that you um, can maintain your advantage. Right? If you try to um, try something risky and new mm -hmm. don't try to um never don't don't dispose the advantage you have currently mm -hmm. uh for the sake of something that you want to achieve but it's not certain otherwise you end up losing everything um so and as you establish like backup plans right being prepared planning for things being a planner it's you will be more prepared to succeed you will know you, you it, it, making a very conscious decision to not get caught like off guard you can be, you can essentially be prepared to, um, you can uh, be, be prepared to minimize the costs of your failures and um, be prepared to move on, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, I, I would say um, utilizing jiu-jitsu, it's a great tool to actually train you physically to respond to extreme pressure and stress. Mm. Uh, if you are, it's, it's the best exposure therapy, I think, in my opinion, because if you can think clearly, excuse me, I do have a phone call. Um, if you can think clearly while it, like an opponent twice the size is trying to pin you, strangle you, subject mm. you to like joint locks, then you can um, easily go in to like a room full of people and just pitch a sales idea um, to just present your new product. 
mm. uh, because there's just a bunch of people wearing suits. If you can, if you can get desensitized to um, that onset of aggression and stay calm and composed, then um, it it makes every other like stressful situation in life much more trivial, much more manageable. So mm. these are like the main five main takeaways that I have been fortunate to discover uh, yeah. throughout the few years that I've been practicing. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, just on your last point, I mean, I think there is definitely something to exposing yourself to uncomfortable like circumstances. I mean, yeah, it's super easy to be, you know, very comfortable um, in a comfortable circumstance. But when you expose yourself to, you know, high pressure, challenging environments, as you mentioned, um, you know, you learn, you, you can learn a lot about yourself. And I mean, just listening to you um, for the last few minutes, explain those five lessons in detail. Um, I think it's really awesome how, you know, you've um, reflected upon those experiences and ultimately, you know, transformed them into um, a learning tool for other people. Um, and, you know, something that I found particularly interesting is um, just how universal those lessons you learn from that sport, um, sport are. Um, you know, some of those principles about, you know, um, taking ownership over your own development, um, uh, being responsible for your own development and exposing yourself to high pressure environments is obviously something that you can, you know, then go and translate into whatever personal professional environment that you're in. Um, so I think that's uh, really valuable. And, um, you know, I think it's also something um, that's really important to these conversations that we're having right now is, um, you know, sh allowing young people in particular to reflect on those experiences um, to, um, to, and to reflect on, um, you know, the ups and downs of a particular pathway um, that they pursue. Um, and as we were touching uh, off air, um, an important part of those representations of a pathway um, is not just capturing the ups, um, but also capturing the downs as well. Um, and you've mentioned a couple of times, you know, some of the challenges you've faced um, uh, being engaged in, in martial arts and jujitsu. Uh, for example, um, you know, being under intense pressure and tapping out and submitting over and over. Um, so, I mean, in your own experiences, um, was, was that the biggest challenge you faced um, and the biggest challenge you've encountered practicing jujitsu, or has there been other challenges and obstacles that you've encountered along the way? Oh, plenty. Um, <laughs> and be, like you said, because of how universal those uh, those lessons are, you know, I they they have they occur pretty often. Like the opportunity to mm. um, to I guess embody those um, those principles. And that definitely took some time, you know, find, figure, and I kind of figured out sort of um, many of these epiphanies through many hours of like critical self-reflection and um, disillusionment. Mm, yeah. um, is this really worth my time? Especially when I was training judo, essentially like seven days a week competitively, uh, I would say, and then and weight training and cardio training on the mm. side. Uh, is it worth it? What am I getting out of this besides a few medals and a belt? Uh, maybe a few... Uh, a few claps when I'm standing on like the on a stage but is that worth so many hours of my life mm. um so it, I, I had to find a way to figure out sort of like the spiritual I, I wouldn't say spiritual I would say like uh mental lessons that I've learned because mm. as you as, as I got older I, feel, I felt like the physical was it's good it's intoxicating <laughs> but is that enough um, to sort of justify spending so much time in it, I'm not mm. too sure. That's why I, I definitely had that um, that period of dis like disillusionment, and yeah. and like these lessons are just sort of like products of that um, of that process. Um, and another big another big mistake, uh, big challenge I faced was just being comfortable with making mistakes. Uh, be patient with the patient you learn. I, I've had horrible horrible <laughs> teachers um from not from martial arts but from from school um right. that really that really demolish your confidence with the things they say and how they um how they uh like how they i guess respond to your uh queries when you're stuck when you're having trouble with some mm. particular area, uh, area and so um I realized that through martial arts, if I can get through um, like many levels of difficult training and many time, many frequent, like countless times of failure, um, then I can be patient enough to do anything else, to learn anything else. Mm. So that was the biggest challenge as well.
Yeah. I mean, you mentioned there that you've had some pretty, pretty ordinary teachers along the way, um, you know, um, at school, for example. Um, and, you know, ultimately you found yourself uh, becoming a martial arts instructor and teacher in uh, evolution and jujitsu. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned off air, like I wouldn't know the first thing about jujitsu, but from what I've read through a quick Google search, um, evolution jujitsu is about um, you know, practical and personal protection um, which we touched on um, a few minutes ago as well. So can you tell us a bit about how you transitioned from you know, becoming a student um, to, to a practice um, to ultimately teaching uh, evolution jiu-jitsu? Yeah, um, to, to start off, I, made hold, I may hold the title of an instructor, but really I'm just still a student who's actively trying to share the art. Mm -hmm. uh, truly, it's, it's, it's a privilege. I, I think yeah. that I personally really enjoy teaching. By sharing the art, you actually uncover those, um, I would say, little discoveries along the way in the process of articulating a technique to students. So you actually gain those mini epiphanies that, and new ways of understanding different interlock pieces of the puzzle. So mm -hmm. it's refreshing. It makes you fall in love with the art once more every time. Yeah. Uh, my, my transition process from being, being a student um, to take it on more, taking on a more active role in teaching is a combination of um, digging into how I discovered the most optimal way of learning for me, which is studying the fundamentals of field and building those, building upon them and then making connections between them. Um, so I, I'm, I'm most receptive to like a verbally instructive approach um, coupled with maybe a little bit of a visual aid. So mm -hmm. uh, my most important mentor is actually uh, my uh, a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu instructor. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm really blessed because he's taught me um, and gives me so much. And I'm excited every time when I get to help a student gain confidence, you know, to witness a light bulb, like click moment uh, where everything finally clicks. So another element of this combination was just a gradual development of my confidence to teach. Um, it wasn't really until I started teaching that I gained confidence to um, embrace my affinity to speaking. Um, I, I had, I definitely had some social anxiety when I was speaking, like I would say public speaking anxiety. So yeah, yeah. that was fantastic training. I, I even recommend this to my friends. Like they were asking me, hey, how do you do good in an interview? Like, and I said, um, well, find something you're good at and teach it to people, teach it to a group of people, mm -hmm. it helps. It's tremendously helpful, mm. um, and I, I and of course, like um, despite like my level of proficiency in martial arts, um, I still need to be. I, I still need to be. Keep, I, I still need to keep learning. So yeah, yeah, it's really just a process of sharing and learning along the way. It's just taking on an extra role, a more active role. Um, yeah. And yeah, yeah, so that's pretty much how I transitioned. And for you, I mean, just to follow on from that, is this, do you find, you know, value and enjoyment from, you know, passing down those lessons and experiences that you've learned to uh, like a younger generation? Like, are you instructing like mostly children, young adults? Um, what's the go there? I, um, I instructed, um, I still do. I, I, I have instructed um, of teenagers yeah. from I'd say 13 and above to mm -hmm. adults. Okay. Um, okay. So it across like a wide range. And yeah, for you, is there, do you find like enjoyment or value in passing down those lessons? Is that something that gives you like a, like a sense of purpose or a sense of joy? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Um, just that, like I was saying, like when you see that light bulb movement, it's like when everything yeah. clicks, it, it's, it's amazing because um, very often I wish, um, like when I, uh, like I think a lot of people have that same experience with different fields that they do, mm. they're, they're, they're in. Um, they, all people always say, hey, I wish I could tell, like, um, you know, maybe like myself from 10 years ago, mm. how to do this. You know, I would have made a lot less mistakes. It would have been much easier. Mm. Um, but you know, you can't do that because you no know, time's passed. But what you can do is um, to take a proactive uh, attitude and try to help the people who are going through the phase that you have gone through. So uh, when you 
uh, when you essentially pass on this hard learned ex hard earned experiences, mm -hmm. I think it's for the better. I think people pay it forward. I definitely, I, I definitely am trying to pay it forward because I've been privileged to have received like a lot of guidance and like mentoring from multiple fields that I'm in, not just martial arts, from many mm -hmm. many areas. So um, yeah, I think it definitely has that infectious effect of like paying it forward. Yeah, and it, I mean, you mentioned earlier just there about the light bulb moment and. Um, you know, on a previous interview as well, um, you know, Doris mentioned how, you know, she found great joy from, um, for context, she was a, she was a trainee uh, teacher uh, and she found great joy in, um, in helping students um, with their mathematics. And, you know, when it, when it starts to click with them and they, when they had that light bulb moment, that's, she described it as that's the reason, that's her purpose. That's the reason she gets up in the morning to to pursue a particular profession. So it's really cool to see how exactly. how you've you've uh, mentioned that as well. It feels magical, really. I think <laughs> teaching anything is just really magical when you have when you see that light bulb moment. I think that's why people go to work. Yeah. Mm. I really think so. I think it's a very intrinsic thing. Mm. So Brandon, I wanted to transition to your university experience briefly. Um, so, you know, you initially, as we mentioned off air, you initially started with one degree uh, and then you later um, chose to study your degree now, which is the Bachelor of Commerce. Um, so I just wanted to ask firstly, you know, what made you change your degree to ultimately pursue your Bachelor of Commerce um, degree? Okay. Um... Well, for context, I studied psychology and government slash international relations in 2018. Yeah. Uh, there were several reasons why I did that. Uh, I, I, I had that selection uh, and it was because I never really had exposure to, uh, exposure to the fields such as psychology and I asked. So I wanted to tame that curiosity, you know, just find out what it is. I probably <laughs> don't do it again. I knew yeah, that yeah. I actually knew that it was not the right career path for me. I knew it. Um, before I started, um, but it was just um, that pure curiosity that I wanted to tame. Mm. And um, another reason why I selected um, like IR and psychology was because I liked, I wanted to embrace my affinity to public speaking. Uh, I like the idea of being able to, being able to express your um, political standpoints and arguments. And coupled with doing that, psychology seemed like a field that would show you how to understand people you know, what people were thinking, mm -hmm. um, which I think that was, that's just really exaggerated by TV looking back. Um, so I thought that was a good combo. Yeah. yeah. And so when I switched to, and what made me want to switch to commerce, well, it's kind of funny. It sounds kind of funny because I decided to study commerce because I always had an interest in teaching, which is a medium really? for me to explore like opportunities of speaking and instructing. But to me, business consulting, it seemed very attractive being able to critically um, analyze, um, discuss and offer solutions. I think that's something that I was really drawn to. And so it's not, and it really isn't that different from teaching. You're just applying it in a different, like a business business context. Mm -hmm. So that's why I took on commerce is like a starting point um, to go in that direction. Yeah, okay. And I mean, you, you're in your fourth year of your degree now um, after changing that degree. Um, and I thought it was, quite interesting to me how you initially picked that um you know psychology part despite knowing that you didn't want to pursue it in the future that's that's quite interesting to me to be honest um so based on your four years um uh, of experience at university um what advice would you give to someone who might be on the opposite end who might just be entering university um what advice would you give mm. uh, to that person to really get the most out of their university experience and time at university Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, go out, meet people, have fun. Um, don't be afraid to make that first move to talk to people and join societies. Really. It's amazing how a group of people with common interests can click with you so instantaneously. Mm. Like I personally think that people you meet in uni can are probably going to be like friends for life. Uh, I, I, I could definitely test it out because I actually met most of my close friends yeah. um, in, in the judo club. Uh, it feels amazing when you can just like talk to them because it's so it felt so easy the first time i came up i went up to them i was like hey how are you going and uh how is how do you find your training because i started a little bit earlier than uh, most of my close friends in judo mm -hmm. this probably started like six months after i did so i asked them how they went for their first few times um yeah. in the training sessions and um it's it's so valuable uh, these people when you finish exams and you go out to hang out with them um mm -hmm. and um, 
I feel like to me that's especially important because of like that oasis they provide. Um, you know, uh, an oasis of support, of friendship, and just having fun. Mm. Um, while doing that, while having fun in uni, um, start taking initiative to speak to industry professionals and find a mentor. It's invaluable having a mentor. Like there's so many industry insights that you can't research online, truly. Like you'd have to actually talk to people mm -hmm. and to hear about what they say uh, about their hard earned experience and lessons and what the work's actually about. Because um, same idea as like studying a textbook and actually going out there to work and mm -hmm. to do the field work, it's a completely different experience. Yeah. So having a mentor is, Definitely having one foot in the door. Yeah. Um, probably the last advice I would offer, uh, I, I, um, I think would be great, is focusing on obtaining a position in, uh, in like a vacational, like a, like a cadetship program in the mm. firm that you want to work in. Uh, if you are trying to hop over a fence, you want to come right up to the fence and then jump over it. So it's definitely much easier to be rehired for a graduate position after you passed a round table uh, discussion of your internship. So it's very, I actually, I can attest to this because it's so common to see new grads coming in, uh, coming back after having done an internship in the past. So um, yeah, these, uh, this would be my advice. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite interesting to, to uh, notice that, you know, those pieces of advice that um, you gave were, um, I suppose, outside you know, the classroom in, in, in university. So I think it just goes to show that, you know, how comprehensive a university experience can be. Um, it's not just, it's not all, all about, you know, what you do inside the classroom, what you learn from a textbook, but um, as you mentioned, and as, as, as your uh, advice suggested, you know, it's about meeting people, making friends, networking, um, you know, gaining professional experience. So I found that quite interesting uh, about the advice you, you gave. And, I mean, going back to what you talked about um, when you were talking about your judo experience, um, you know, it's about putting yourself in those uncomfortable circumstances. Um, you know, it can be a little bit daunting to, you know, go up to a, a group of strangers and introduce yourself and, um, you know, try to make friends in that in that context. So um, I definitely think there is something to putting yourself in uncomfortable um, circumstances. And um, I get the feeling that's a bit of an underlying theme uh, running through most of um, the messages that you're you're saying as well so i mean on that last point you talked about you know gaining professional experience so um you were able to do that through a cadetship with ey uh, and you've since moved on to other roles within the company so i mean you talked about the importance of speaking to people who have been there and done that so i think that's another really important part of this conversation and um you know i'd like to give you an opportunity to do exactly that so can you tell us a bit about the roles that you've had with EY uh, and how you uh, how you progress through the company um, and just generally your experience with that with that company? Sure. So, chronologically speaking, I started um, I did uh, a tax vacation program in EY Hong Kong. Yeah, um, that's where I'm from, and mm -hmm. um, and then I eventually I reached um, I, I I reached out to um, essentially the recruitment department uh, of EY to ask about sort of like technology. And I found out about like these different service lines and um, through the assessment center, I was very fortunate to, to have been um, given the opportunity to actually work there. And um, yeah, I started in January, 20, 2020 last year. Uh, so it's actually, it's funny. It's kind of funny because I actually have my one year anniversary, work anniversary on LinkedIn, <laughs> uh, which is actually something I, I really do appreciate because um, it's it's definitely been like a very rewarding year. My service line is um, technology risk. So a little, little bit of a background about what technology risk actually is. Um, so from my understanding, risk is a, it's a very universally pertinent concept um, that affects almost every business these days because Technology and business operations are so, like, I would say, inextricably embedded. Yeah, you, they, they can't be they can't be taken apart. Um, so, to ensure that the, the business processes actually run smoothly um, and in an optimal fashion that meets the organization's objectives, uh, one of the solutions is to actually look into the technology to ensure the integrity of the technology that drives those um, operations. Um, so that's why um, 
risk mitigation for technology. Um, that's how it comes about because we're trying to ensure ourselves from the risk of technology not functioning properly, which affects business operations. So um, I basically perform uh, field work and testing. Um, I review evidence sent through by clients and I also do the documentation, essentially reports that we do as well. Um, I've been very fortunate that I've participated in like several types of audits and in industries and sectors. I've worked mm -hmm. with um, council clients, I've worked with um, uh, telecommunications, manufacturing, education, finance uh, sectors. Um, and I've done uh, a variety of audits um, from both like financial, reg financially regulatory type audits as, uh, as well as like sort of what we call internal audits, which are um, audits that aren't necessarily uh, performed to be compliant. They're performed to optimize business performance. Right. So um, that's essentially what my role is. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's super interesting to hear about, you know, somebody in a particular role, particularly a young person who can, um, you know, give a bit of information, a bit of uh, insight into what it's like, um, you know, in a particular position. Um, so another thing off air, which we, which we wanted to discuss, um, the both of us was, you know, some of the challenges and sort of expectations you had going into working for, for EY, which is, obviously a huge multinational company. Um, you were talking off air about, um, you touched on like imposter syndrome um, and a few, a few different um, you know, challenges you faced initially working for such a big company. So I, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about you know, what were some of the expectations you had going into EY and um, was it quite difficult to um, adapt to such a big company at such a young age? You entered when you were 20, 21, you mentioned. Yeah. So 21. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, th I think my concerns going in was number one, wow, it's a big four, um, the amount of global exposure and global outreach that we have through this, mm. plat uh, that this platform like offers. Am I ready for that? Um, I'm just a uni student. I, yes, I've worked the same company for tax, but that's different because mm. as, as an intern, versus a cadet it's there's a massive difference in what you do um so my expectations going in was that the people would be i thought that people would be like really intense it would be extremely stressful because you'd have to meet like tight deadlines um as a big four in a big four firm and mm. without a lot of access to help um, which i definitely have experienced before when i worked in um um, several real estate internships and yeah. even like a digital marketing internship that I worked in in Hong Kong as well. Uh, so that's definitely happened before. In terms of um, what I, I, in terms of what's rewarding about this, uh, about my current role is that number one to people, to working culture is fantastic. Um, I like how diversity is really embraced and celebrated. Um, Work-life balance is mm. actually pretty emphasized because <laughs> we work hard during, uh, during busy times, but we also uh, put in time to celebrate our successes um, and achievements. Mm -hmm. So like throughout this, uh, throughout like the past year, I've always felt supported um, by many mentors and many, uh, even like the fellow um, consultants like uh, my grade, like the culture team was fantastic. I think we should support here is something I really value. Um, yeah. In terms of like really valuable lessons, I definitely learned many, many. I just, I, I don't think I can really capture all of them uh, mm -hmm. right now. But what I can say are, are two things. Mm -hmm. Number one, always ask why. Um, they encourage you to ask why, because I, and I've learned to embrace that because it's so common for people to not question what information they're receiving. As consultants, we have something called um, professional, uh, I would say reasonable skepticism. Uh, and that's something we should really try to maintain because there are things that are undeniably true and things in the way they are. But sometimes you should also look at how things can be changed. Um, and I'm not talking about, um, I don't know, like I'm not talking about processing like client evidence. I'm just talking about in general terms where you, you want to learn how to embrace the why and uh, figuring out how you can uh, see like whether some things can be changed, whether you can uh, be flexible with some things, whether you can do um, do things differently while aligned to those fundamental core principles. Like I applied this in martial arts where you play around with like different variations and while adhering to general principles of like leverage and um, and things like that, I applied yeah. this to learning Japanese, 
that where I'm able to play with like the placement of different grammar structures, uh, like grammar structures, because um, they are core principles. But there's also like you also have room for flexibility. So being able to identify that room for flexibility in mm -hmm. learning, that's pretty important. And I apply it to my career as well when I'm acquiring like technical knowledge, um, like understanding the fundamentals, mm -hmm. building upon them, and then look trying to find and connect those interrelated relationships between different concepts. Um, so yeah, that's something that that's the first takeaway um, that I am really privileged to have received. Um, and the second takeaway actually relates to my biggest challenge as well, is that I, I had to transition from like a uni student mindset into a consultant mindset, um, like being spoon fed with information. Uh, it's something that a lot, a lot of people have, co have come to expect over the years of like um, school and uni. Uh, but it's very important to be asking the intelligent, meaningful questions at work. You don't want to just be asking um, like, how do I do this? Like you don't want to just be passing the ball back to your senior. Um, as graduates, you or like consultant analyst level, it's our responsibility to figure out uh, to minimize the need to say, I don't know how to do this. Can you show me how? Um, and instead, what we should be asking is, I think it's this based on these reasons. And um, can you please confirm if my my approach is correct? Um, because if you're just passing the ball back to the senior and you're just asking to show you how, they could have just easily done your work for you. So yes, in the first six to 12 months of um, uh, or like on the job in your position, you typically be asking a lot of how questions, but eventually as you get more mature in terms of your technical understanding and experience, you will need to start asking more intelligent and like thought out questions. But you also need to find that balance between asking for help uh, without putting in enough time to resolve it by yourself. Yeah. And, um, and not asking for help often enough that you become really inefficient and essentially you get stuck in something that you run out of time. Mm -hmm. um, so the best advice I got from my mentor is um, if you're stuck in something after spending like half an hour, um, like 30 minutes, ask for help. By the time you reach the 30 minute mark, you spend enough time thinking about it, thinking through it, and you've already tried the best. That's when you should be asking for help. So like that would be my biggest takeaway, my second biggest takeaway. Yeah. I think those are some really cool, again, really cool insights, really cool ins uh, takeaways for uh, other young people to be exposed to. Um, one of the challenges, I suppose, that you faced, as we mentioned off air, was um, allocating your time efficiently. Um, and, you know, you mentioned um, in your martial arts how, you know, um, being resourceful and managing your time is, you know, a, a fundamental principle of that sport. So, I mean, after releasing the first five uh, interviews of this particular project. Uh, I've been talking to a few people um, and, you know, a common thing that they say is, um, you know, it's, super, it's really, really cool to be exposed to people who are, um, you know, challenging themselves and taking on different initiatives and um, doing really amazing things. Um, but a common, I suppose, um, thing they say is, um, you know, how on earth do they do this? How, how do they have enough time? There's only 24 hours in a day. How are they um, doing, you know, the university stuff? Um, while whilst balancing all these different extracurricular initiatives. So um, I imagine that balancing your full-time position at uh, EY, studying part-time at UCID, um, as well as all your extracurricular uh, activities um, would be challenging to say the least. So um, I just wanted to pose the question to you, like, um, you know, what advice would you give to someone um, who may be balancing numerous commitments like yourself, um, just to stay really organized and motivated and driven? Um, so currently because I'm working full-time and studying part-time, uh, definitely at the peak of like both work and uni, uh, long hours are not uncommon. Um, they definitely happen and working full-time definitely has changed my lifestyle. Um, as like, as a student, um, time was more of a luxury, but, uh, but now I'm fully packed pretty much like six days a week. So to fit that, to fit into time to do things that matter to me scheduling and productivity became a lot more important mm -hmm. than when I was just doing uni. So this is like a strong motivator for me uh, to improve my productivity, um, work output and discipline. So I became a lot more conscious of how I spent time. And even I even use like a timesheet uh, system to track how I spend time throughout the week. 
uh, essentially like by 30 minute windows to keep myself accountable. So when you have less time, it becomes like a valuable commodity. And um, I, I think that you would naturally become more aware uh, of how you can maximize your time uh, by utilizing this kind of timesheet system. I also have like a schedule um, to plan out sort of like um, by, again, like 30 minute window, like how I spend time throughout the week. But, um, you know, balance is key. You can't fully devote yourself to work and, you can't, and ignore what you need and vice versa. And outside of work, you had, to think, you had to think about your physical health and your friends and your mental health. Mm -hmm. So you need to allocate, like, um, I would say adequate time. And sometimes you need to be kind to yourself because it's okay to schedule um, it, 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 it's okay for the schedule sometimes to be like disrupted. Sometimes it just happens. Mm -hmm. And um, it's okay to deviate from the schedule um, every once in a while. So um, I think you need to, every, everyone needs to be able to find a balance between being consistent and being flexible uh, while forgiving yourself when you mess up. It does happen. You know, we're only people, we're not perfect. And you immediately get back on track. Being um, don't don't have any attachment to failure. Learn from your mistakes, but don't get attached. That's really really important. Mm -hmm. um, and one important thing though um, is that like discipline and willpower is a muscle that needs to be consistently trained. You need to repeatedly. It's a repeatable. It's a repeatable skill. It really is. You need to train it. It's almost like a physical skill. So knowing how to do it's not enough. So to build habits, you actually need to consistently practice it. So yes, you do want to try to align to your schedule as often as you can, but be flexible and uh, learn from your mistakes. Mm. Um, if you do get distracted, if you do deviate from it, find a solution. If I get distracted by <laughs> sometimes even LinkedIn, <laughs> I block LinkedIn with um, Cold Turkey, uh, which is like yeah. an app on my computer. So um, being non, be, not being attached, learning from your mistakes, having like a concrete schedule but having a flexible mindset, it's probably yeah. the best way to manage your time. All right. So in closing, Brandon, uh, one of the things I really was fascinated about you was the fact that you're writing your own book entitled uh, Mastering the Ability to Succeed, Living Up to Your Full Potential. Um, and so firstly, I just want to ask you, where exactly did the inspiration uh, come from um, to start writing your own book? Mm, so um, I wrote it. I kind of wrote the book for the intention of letting uh, some young teenager out there who just turned 18 um, and is trying to figure out how to become an adult. Because um, I I think that, you know, like turning 18, it's like a very pro prominent thing mm. uh, in Australia. You, you're allowed to uh, drink and purchase yeah. alcohol legally. It's mm -hmm. uh, a privilege like that was valued by many of my younger friends who lacked fake IDs <laughs> back yeah. in high school. Um, but Overall, you're just more independent. You are independent from parental permission. You get to sign your own waiver. You get to sign your own contracts and you can literally do whatever you want. Life has become your responsibility. So um, when I turned 18, I thought, yeah, I'm already an adult, uh, but I didn't really know. I was the furthest thing from being an adult because um, being an adult, it's not just about like buying properties and like buying cars. It's not about paying taxes and being employed full time um, and starting a family. It's about taking control of your life. It's about taking responsibility for your own development. So um, it's not about making a lot of money uh, or buying new clothes. It's about living up to your full potential and trying and starting to look into that direction of thought. So this epiphany got me wondering it prompted me to ask um how can i do that because an average human lives for like around 79 years and so how can we maximize um, every moment of our lives to live as fruitfully as possible so as soon as i turned 18 i i knew that i wanted to make a dent in the world and i just had to figure out how you know it's such mm -hmm. a long road um so yeah that was the inspiration so for those that aren't familiar with exactly the subject matter of your book you're you're basically from my understanding drawing upon your own experiences in martial arts and jiu-jitsu is that right um that's is i would say uh, i'd say it's part of it yeah but then again uh, many of the epiphanies i had um throughout my training in martial arts they can be um you can draw parallels uh, between that training on the mat and off yeah. the mat 
Yeah. Um, but I, I would say that's like a, an, like an all-encompassing um, umbrella concept, but it's not the only inspiration. It's not the only avenue of discussion. Right. Okay. So, I mean, for someone like me, who's more accustomed to obviously reading books than actually writing them, take us inside mm -hmm. to the actual process of, um, I suppose, the creative process behind starting to write your own book. Um, mm -hmm. For example, mm -hmm. where exactly, you know, where on earth do you start when you're um, taking on such a, what seems like a big task? Yeah, it, it's hard, you know, and this just goes back to that one of the um, epiphanies that I, I had in training where you had to take things step by step, um, sequentially structuring sort of like how you want to approach a, um, a particular goal that requires you to break things down. So I, I started by writing um, sort of like the, ma the many overarching qualities such as like discipline, willpower, confidence. I was like brainstorming, you know, what makes a guy successful? Um, and then I divided the chapters um, by the factors that can lead to those qualities. For example, like chapter five, um, exercise your will. Um, utilizing willpower is not, like the knowledge is not enough. You'd have to actually practice it like a muscle. Chapter six, target the fundamentals. Mm -hmm. uh, necessities of like um, mental health, uh, sleep, diet, exercise. It doesn't have to be martial arts. It's just one of the many possible avenues. You can be doing yoga and that could still be your, own. Um, that could still be your oasis, your physical outlet. Mm -hmm. Chapter seven, setting up your day for success. Um, how do you plan out your day? Does waking up at a, at a particular time influence your willpower throughout the day? I, I would share my thoughts on that one. Um, so, and even like, for example, chapter nine, like being a planner. So like, these are all like sort of factors that contribute to the overarching quality of discipline. You know, what makes discipline? So I was just really breaking it down um, into uh, from like a top down pyramid-like structure. So it just gets wider, wider, and wider to like the bottom. Um, so yeah, that was like essentially the process. Okay. And I mean, obviously an important part of that process is you know, overcoming setbacks and obstacles and challenges. So, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you, you often hear, of, for example, things like writer's block, for example, uh, but take us inside <laughs> into, into what some of the, some of the challenges that you faced, um, you know, in your writing process mm -hmm. and creative process. Yeah, absolutely. And it's funny how sometimes it was ironic that I was writing a chapter about um, failure and um, overcoming, um, overcoming setbacks. And I was actually dealing with writer's block <laughs> during yeah. in that chapter. So it, it's it's um, poetic, but also kind of funny. But um, I would say um, there are a variety of challenges. Number one, I would I would classify that challenge that type of challenges um, evolution because I uh, I I think I mentioned um, yesterday uh, to you as well earlier yeah. that because of um, how these um, I guess these thoughts I have, these ideas I have, um, uh, for example, setting up your day for success, um, you know, being a planner. Um, to me, those are still ideas that are still evolving. There are things to add, there are things to change, mm. um, but if they're not set in stone, then how long is it gonna take to figure out, you know, what's the most optimal way? And also how do I, phrase my ideas in a way that's universally applicable to most people to, to mm. um so where it's it's going to be different because because people are different uh, like as unique individuals but um my intention was to share over for, to share experiences that can be conformed to each individual's personal experience they're going to be applied differently and uniquely um but if i if i were if i if i had written my ideas in a way that's way too centered around my experience would readers find really that applicable that relevant to their lives because that would contradict my purpose so that was like the first um, type of challenge the second type of challenge um would be categorization i think because you know like these ideas of uh, are very intertwined you know so for example if i were to talk about um willpower like discipline and uh, willpower, okay, number one, you can figure out the definition. How do you define them separately? Number two, um, 
which chapter is for which quality because um many sometimes if you have like being a planner um as like a chapter and that the, and when you and essentially that crux of the chapter is about setting up your day for success your environment uh, that your work environment influences your um your motivation to um, keep going during hard times and also for example setting up your day in, um, setting up your day for success could be just making your bed in the morning i've seen this um video from like gocast about this admiral in the navy seals who was who, who basically said setting uh if you want to be successful in life start by waking up every day and just making your bed because that will motivate you to into um doing everything else throughout the day but if you're talking about setting up your day for success where does that come into how and how does that tie into different qualities and sometimes you can have one chapter leading to different qualities they can achieve both qualities so that um it's a very complex process of trying to figure out where to slot things in where to have that separation of different concepts but at the same time i also want to try and be able to capture those interconnected relationships between those chapters that like, that contribute to the overall whole mm -hmm. so it's something i'm still trying to figure out and uh yeah i mean it's challenging but is also very thought-provoking I, I like how it keeps me on edge it definitely does because there's so many changes in the ideas i have yeah. and the category uh, the categorization of if these are always changing so yeah um it reminds me of like this author um who's called uh, malcolm gladwell and he was talking about how um like when he writes books um like he's mm -hmm. written like numerous books and um you know five ten years later you know he doesn't identify with the, the content in that book because you know yeah. his his perception of that idea has continually evolved so um mm -hmm. yeah i definitely see a connection there and uh, I, I thought that was quite interesting uh, as well yeah yeah i um, think it's everybody's yeah. book yeah of course um brandon that pretty much brings us to the end of our conversation um mm -hmm. for those who are listening just on audio it, it has spanned over the the length of two days so i appreciate your time um i do understand that you know you've just wrapped up your summer exams at uni um and had a few other things going on as well so uh, i just want to say that i'm very grateful and appreciative uh for your time and um Thank your you. effort in joining the conversation Oh, absolutely. And likewise, I, um, I mentioned, I've mentioned this earlier, but I've always appreciated sort of like the um, authenticity and the genuine nature of this conversation where you have conversations with people essentially show you um, the ups and the downs. Um, mm. Because as I mentioned before, like a lot of people see like the iceberg, but they never actually see what's underneath the iceberg, what's underneath the water. So um it's it's good to be vulnerable it's good to share and uh, i appreciate the opportunity